to me now. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jub-jub bird and shun the frimulous bandersnatch. We realized it's our fifth anniversary, and we thought, hey, we haven't done a Q&A in a while, so might as well do a Q&A for five years of retroblasting. And so what we did was we put out a request to everybody on our Facebook page. Uh, we have about 9,000 of all of you on our Facebook page. And we said, hey, you know, ask some questions over the next few weeks for our uh, fifth anniversary and we'll do this Q&A. Um, so we're gonna read some of these questions and s try and give you some answers, I guess, right? Uh, so let's get started. I'll just jump right in, pretty, pretty simple. Have you ever been contacted directly by a toy manufacturer for consulting? No. Uh, we did ask to uh, talk to Hasbro at one point because we were trying to do a documentary uh, called The Elephant in the Toy Room. And it was all about how over the last 20 plus years, uh, big manufacturers like Hasbro and Mattel have bought up all the other smaller toy companies. And that's why you don't see many competing brands anymore like you know, Remco and Tomy and uh, Galoob and LJN, they've all been absorbed. Um, but we didn't get uh, we didn't get a response from them. That would be something. Uh, no, that that hasn't happened. Although several people that are fans have said that they know people that maybe we could be put in touch with people. But to date, that has not happened. So um, we'll see. That would be cool. We know the retro blasting archives are huge, but is there a toy you don't have and wish you did? What do you two consider to be your holy grail? Um, this is tricky because if this had been four years ago, I would have answered this question outright. Um, there are some toys I don't have that I, I wish I had. Um, the problem is, is that we've actually experienced uh, some incidents now where when we vocalize what we're looking for, people have actually snaked those things out from under us and then come back on us and bragged about it. Um, so I don't mean to sound like, oh, I don't want to tell you what that stuff is. But um, if we're going to be doing further videos about things that we still need items for, then we're actually in a position where I, I can't say what those are because we have people out there who are waiting for me to say things like that and then actively watch for those things and then snake them from me. And, um, and only to be vindictive, not because they themselves want them. It's pretty messed up. So, um, but there are items out there that I still want. Um, there's a lot of modern stuff that I'd really like to have, uh, actually. I know that sounds weird, but like the Hot Toys sideshow uh, Bespin Luke Skywalker. Um, I'd love to get the Gentle Giant jumbo vintage Jedi Luke Skywalker. I think those would be really cool. When you were starting up Retro Blasting, did you ever see it or yourselves having such a large and positive impact on us 80s kids? And what are your feelings on the impact? I think that it's no, we definitely did not think about that. I think for for our part, we were mostly, and, and Michael has said this before, we were thinking about what is the void of what's out there in, in the YouTube space and on the internet of people talking about these things that we know a lot about and care a lot about. Uh, and, and how is that content being conveyed and what is the quality of that content? And there was a lot of sort of gaps in there. So mostly what we were thinking of is how do we fill those gaps and make the kind of content that as a consumer we would want to consume. Um, so we were thinking about it from that perspective, not how other people would see it and go, wow, that, that means a lot to me. And that's, it's the best part of what we do. Honestly, there's, there are days where, you know, you get negative comments or you're just having a bad day, but seeing the really great comments that you guys leave that are so supportive, it really does help carry us through, um, to, to keep pushing out content. So thank you guys for that. I've been dying to see a retrospective on the 80s series Robotech. Can't wait to see your thoughts on this groundbreaking anime. Um, we have been working on the, the Robotech slash Macross uh, video for a really long time, and it's because it's a really big uh, subject. There are multiple, you know, iterations of the cartoon. There's all the toys, and we really want to do it right. And so because it's such a big thing to, to start out, it, it's just it's going to take us a while to get there. But 
don't think for a minute that we're not – we talk about it at least once a month. Like, you know, where are we with Robotech and when do we want to dive into that? Because it's a really big pool to dive into. I've actually written the script for part one uh, about uh, Macross. Uh, I'm waiting on doing that. There's still some things I need to put into play. Uh, but I really want to make the Robotech series. It's, it was going to be a big series, and it still will be. So just give me a little more time because there are some things in the background that uh, I need to, to have ready for that one. Seeing as you've done a video focusing on the Rogue One figures, and that broke into a discussion about how modern Hasbro has lost its touch from a few years ago with vehicles and playsets, is it now likely you'll do a video on what you considered the best recent toy of recent years, Imaginext? Um... I would love to do a video on Imaginext, and I, I know that about four years ago I made this uh, Voltron review video where I said, And I know that Mattel can do better. I know that they have design teams that can do this better, and I'm going to prove it to you in the next video, and you're going to be shocked to find out where their best designers are working right now. I know I never followed up on that, and I meant to. Um, but uh, I will do a video about Imaginex. I know I'm a little past its, its uh, sale date, its expiration date at this point. A lot of the toys that I have aren't actually in stores anymore. But it's still an amazing toy line, and I will talk about it. Uh, I promise I'll do a video. My buddy Andy, who you might remember as the blue tie from Star Wars Follies, uh, he, uh, he has some of the Imaginex toy uh, toys as well. And we're going to pool our resources and, and do a video about that. So that'll come soon. I know you deal with more 70s, 80s cartoons and movies, but I would love to see your thoughts on the early 90s series Exo Squad. It was a small series with a great animation and storyline. If you need some material for this, I can help you with it. Appreciate the generosity. Um, Exo Squad is tangentially related to Robotech. Um, I would love to do that at some point. There's a lot of things I'd love to do. I'm never going to say no to doing something. Like, I'm never going to say, you know, if you ask me a question about, are you ever going to do this? I'm never going to say, no, I'm never going to do that. You got to remember, I started with my childhood collection, which is mostly the 80s and a little bit of the early 90s. So I'm having to buy in two directions. I'm having to buy into the 60s and 70s, and I'm having to buy into the 90s. Um, that's going to take time. And in the meantime, I've got all these toys that I haven't reviewed yet that I don't have to make a purchase on in order to bring a video to you guys. So I'm, I'm starting there and I'm slowly working my way out in two directions. So again, if you guys continue to support the channel with the views and you know liking the videos and sharing the videos and helping grow our audience, then Retro Blasting will be around for a much longer time than it would be if you guys weren't supporting it. And the longer we're around, the more likely that those properties will get reviewed. And that's what's really important. What do you feel is the most underrated of the many obscure 80s lines? I don't know if it's really underrated, but I know it took me by surprise how cool uh, the the Filmation Ghostbusters toy line is. Uh, the cartoon is kind of meh. Like, it's to me, it's very not watchable. But the, the toys are amazing. They're so beautifully made. The playset is so awesome. Um, very expensive. Uh, but I if I had to pick one, that's that's what I would pick. At this point, it seems like all of our 80s toy lines are, are looked at with rose-colored glasses, and they're all gushed on and loved and everything. So is there an underrated? I can tell you about a lot that are overrated, but I don't know if there's one that's truly underrated. Have you ever bought or collected 12-inch military figures like 21st Century Toys, Dragon, or even G.I. Joe? Uh, I don't have any 12-inch military figures. I do have some of the fighter planes from 21st Century Toys. I'm a big World War II uh, history enthusiast, uh, especially Royal Air Force and um, uh, the Allied Allied forces uh, in Europe. And uh, I do have some of the airplanes from 21st Century Toys, the 118 scale. I have the Spitfire, the P-40, and the Messerschmitt 109E. Will you ever come to Canada? Does Retro Blasting plan on going to cons outside of America? I would love to. I wish it was in the budget. Um, I would love to visit Canada. I would love to go back and visit England where I spent you know, my adolescence. I would love to visit a convention in Japan. I would love to go to all kinds of places. It's just a matter of opportunity, timing, uh, and budget. Um, if we're invited, we'll go. And that's, that's, that's where everything really uh, gets in the way. You, know, you, you have to plan uh, the, the cost of travel, 
cost of lodging, meals, and you also have to take days off work. Because for those of you that don't know, we don't do retroblasting uh, as a full-time occupation. We actually have, you know, careers in the real world. And then we do this as a passion that we hope will one day grow into something where we can, you know, walk away from everything else. But until that day happens, um, we're still beholden to the paid time off of the jobs that we work. So that's also an obstacle. At the end of the real Ghostbusters part two, there's an outtake of you emptying a bowl of Cool Whip that, quote, you need for a shot. What the hell are you doing? I have to, I have to empty this container for the shot. Where was this bowl used? Perhaps a deleted scene, a pop culture reference that I completely missed, I've always wondered. Um, I wanted a specific shot composition for uh, that Ghostbusters video. There was a skit that we did about the slime and I wanted to uh, sort of have the camera find my face from the POV of being inside the can as if the camera was the slime. So we needed a way to put the camera through the slime canister. But even if we had been willing to destroy a vintage ectoplasm can, the size of the can wouldn't have been big enough for the camera to physically look through. So we, we rigged up a Cool Whip container to get that shot, and that's why I was having to empty the Cool Whip container. So it's this shot. And there's your answer. Are there any of those classic 80s toy lines or cartoons you think would make for an interesting revival that hasn't as yet been touched, perhaps due to obscurity? Um, they're racing towards completion on that. I mean, they've already announced Sectars is coming back. Ba Bandai redid Thundercats. Uh, Silverhawks has yet to be touched, and I think that's a shame because uh, tribute figures for Silverhawks with modern technology would be awesome. I would love to see what they would do with Silverhawks. Do you see yourself ever doing videos that focus on books, comic books, music, or TV shows that are not cartoons of the appropriate era, or are those topics too far out of the focus of your channel? Uh, no, I'd love to. Um, it's a matter of visuals. Uh, you know, you, when you talk about a book that's just text, for example, um, that almost lends itself to more of like a podcast format because you're not going to be getting any visuals anyway, aside from the cover of the book. So if you're just going to be listening to somebody, it might be worth considering doing like a podcast about a series of 80s books or, or things like that. It is um, something that would lend itself really easily to a podcast, not really so much in a video. And that's because you know, if you're talking about, like, I love 80s metal. You guys know that I'm a big metalhead from the 80s. Um, you can't really play clips of the songs because of, you know, you're going to get pinged on YouTube if you do that. So it's it's just going to be me sitting there talking about, hey, remember that Slayer album? It was super awesome. Yeah. And that's exactly what we don't want to do. Like, we, we really want to take it to the next level and make it a, you know, this is a visual medium, so we need to show you stuff. So even a video like this is kind of like outside of what we would normally do because we want to show you what we're talking about and use the format in the way that it needs to be used. Like it's video, so we're going to show you and talk to you. And so um, we'll get to the podcasting thing, but it does seem like something that would be really good for a podcast because that's where you're waxing poetic about all these different things and just talking ad nauseum about it. You mentioned in your last video, Rogue One Part 2, that you don't plan to cover modern Star Wars toys. Bummer. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the 2008 Millennium Falcon and 2009 AT-AT. Well, just because I'm not doing a full feature on modern Star Wars toys anymore, and I've, I've covered the gamut of that, uh, that's not to say that maybe one day I won't do just a standalone fun video about, say, the big AT, at or the big Millennium Falcon. They certainly are dynamic toy centerpieces. I have them on display on either side of my television here in the studio. Um, I have no plans to get rid of them just because they're so impressive. You know, Melinda and I, when we, when we got them in the mail uh, for the Rogue One video, and I was putting the Millennium Falcon together, she actually looked down and she said, is that, is that the bigger Falcon from a few years back? And I said, yeah. She goes, that's actually really cool. And I was like, yeah, it, it is a cool ship. Since Hasbro don't make play sets, do you think there's a market for non-specific or generic play sets in three and three quarter inch scale? 
let's say an adventure castle or space base that could be used for any branded figure that isn't geared toward niche customs or the collector market. Um, yeah, I think there, I think there should be generics. I know that they've taken advantage of uh, some generic military play sets that came out for sort of off-brand GI Joe competitors. There, there were some uh, Middle Eastern playset cities and towns and things that the GI Joe collectors really love, and they bought those up from you know, all the different lines like the core and battle forces and stuff like that. Have you met any memorable stars or creators of the movies and TV shows you both love? And if so, what were your favorites? Um, well, this is interesting. I met at a, at a convention, Pensacon, a couple years ago. Uh, we were walking through the lobby and I knew that Dirk Benedict was at the convention and obviously, I remember him very well from the A-Team and stuff like that. And I didn't really think that much about it. Like, it wasn't like I was a fangirl for Dirk Benedict. But I will tell you, we got on an elevator with him and, like, my pulse went up. And I normally don't have that reaction around stars because I've met a lot of celebrities at the, you know, meet and greet where you go and you get your autograph or whatever. And it's kind of not that great, not that big a deal to me. Like, cause you're standing in line and that person is never going to remember you. But I talked to Dirk Benedict in the, in the elevator and he was so handsome and so charismatic and it really took me by surprise. And I think that's, that's why it was just like, wow. I mean, I know who Dirk, Dirk Benedict is, but I, there was just something about him. He really has a star quality, even though he's, I think he's in his seventies, but he still had that thing. He he's so it was really cool. And that's a smaller convention. So I got to kind of hang out with him a few times and sort of sit near him and talk to him very casually, not like, Oh my God, will you sign my autograph? But more just like, Hey, you know, that, that was a cool thing you said to that guy a few minutes ago. It was really funny. So that was really cool. And then for me personally, I know this isn't a a TV star or something or movie star, but I'm a huge Tori Amos fan. Um, I've been a fan of hers since 1992 uh, when her first album came out, um, well, her first solo album. And I've met her several times. I got her autograph on a painting that I did for her, of her. And that was probably the coolest experience of my life. She's so nice. She's so, um, when I met her, she was so complimentary of the painting I did of her. Um, it, it was just, it was a really cool moment. The big one for me, the biggest meet for me was meeting Gary Kurtz because he was the producer of Star Wars and the Empire Strikes Back. And I think he really had a larger role to play in the development of those films and, and, and why they're so amazing than the official history books give him credit for. Um, I was able to talk with him um, for quite a few minutes uh, at his table, and then I was able to ask him a few questions at his panel. Um, just a brilliant guy, brilliant man. And I have had the pleasure of meeting uh, Aaron Gray uh, a number of times, who played Wilma Deering on Buck Rogers, and she's just a delightful person. Um, I've met her four or five times. Um, just an amazing woman, and uh, it was a real thrill to meet her. What one show, movie, or comic series that has come out in the last few years do you think would be the basis for a really good line of classic action figures? That's a good question. Um, so nothing that has come out years and years and years ago, but something now that would be a really, a really good action figure line. Uh, the, the one I can think of that really didn't get a lot of toy exposure was Pacific Rim. I think if they had made Pacific Rim robots that had, you know, the opening heads and you put the pilots in them and, you know, then you had the big monsters and all that kind of stuff. I think that would have been a really cool line of toys. Uh, but sadly, didn't happen. We got a few little gypsy dangers and that's about it. What Christmas catalogs are your favorites? I don't really know what that means, but I would say, I mean, if you're asking which brand, I think probably Penny's JC Penny catalog is probably the best catalog. Um, it just seems to have a wider variety of things. Um, I like them all because they're all kind of different and they all kind of capture different market segments. And, and after doing all the research that I did, or the Christmas catalog video that I, I worked on, I really have a whole different level of appreciation for what goes into making them. So they're kind of like little snapshots of culture and little pieces of, of art and all these people's efforts that are sort of encapsulated in this little mag, this magazine that you can just fl flip through and go, wow, 
This is like a real, this is what real people wore. This is what real kids played with at this time. With film franchises like Aliens, Rambo, and Robocop being rated R, but still getting a line of children's toys, do you think any modern R-rated films could get the toy aisle treatment? They kind of already are. I mean, if you think about it, Deadpool has tons of action figures uh, on toy store shelves right now. They're not branded Deadpool the movie, but all the kids know that that's Deadpool, and it says Deadpool on the, on the box. It's just not officially associated with Deadpool the movie. So those toys are already out there. Uh, similarly, um, I'm trying to think there was another rated R movie that, like Logan. You know, that movie's R, but it, there are Wolverine figures on shelves right now that you can go get. Um, so I guess it's a question of, you know, modern rated R films having a dedicated line. Is that really necessary at this point? Have people started asking you for autographs yet? Officially, our first autograph request came from Andy Duvall, and uh, he wanted a photograph. And I'm sorry to say that we are still trying to figure out how to get all our digital photos effectively to nice 8x10s. So Andy is officially the first autograph request. And I am sorry to say that I have still not sent him that autograph, but I have not forgotten about Andy's request to do the autograph, and I will soon. Uh, I have gotten requests for autographs um, when I'm, you know, at conventions or things like that. It's, it's an odd experience because I don't consider myself a celebrity. Um, and uh, my buddy Dale, he, he wanted me to sign his Dungeons & Dragons DVD when I was in Oklahoma City, and I, I did that, and, and that was nice because I, I got to meet Dale, who's a good friend of mine. Um, and, um, and then I, I signed at Joe Lana uh, this year for um, a father and his son. Uh, his son brought up the flyer to Joe Lana and I signed that and he was a nice kid. Um, so yeah, I've, I've signed a few autographs. It's, um, it is a weird experience though, but it's not something that bothers me. Like it's not weird in the way that, you know, it's not like, oh, I don't want to do this. It's just more like, wow, people want my autograph. Okay. If there is ever a nuclear war, which toy or toy line would survive and why? Obviously, Chuck Norris. I mean, because he's Chuck Norris, right? That's what it takes to be a winner. What was the most unexpected thing that sprang from creating the channel? Um, for me, the most unexpected thing was all of you. Uh, it was the fact that so many of you uh, were wanting to be a part of this, that you wanted this kind of material, you wanted to connect and build this community, and you've all been so generous and giving and enthusiastic and supportive and you know, you didn't think about that going into YouTube. You just think I'm about to get torn apart by people in these YouTube comments, but I'm doing this just to see what happens. And um, fortunately, you know, 98 to 99% of you have all been just amazing people. We were not expecting to get such a positive, we weren't even thinking about what kind of response we were going to get, I, I don't think, or at least I wasn't. I was mostly thinking about what kind of content can we put out there um, that's that's going to be different and unique and, and really informative instead of just, hey, here's this action figure, his arms move, and this one's broken, but, you know, normally he has this thing. Like, you know, if we're going to talk about these things, let's really talk about them. Let's talk about where they are in the history of things. Let's talk about the manufacturing process of not, not necessarily the process, but like the marketing of why did they decide to make this figure this way? And you know, really think about it in a sort of from the adult perspective. So I think we were trying to put a voice on something that, that wasn't out there uh, at that time. Favorite G.I. Joe uh, is probably uh, Flash for me. Uh, favorite villain is, uh, it's a toss up between Sunbow's Cobra Commander and Storm Shadow in general. Uh, I love Storm Shadow because I love ninjas, but I love Cobra Commander because he's hilarious. There could be dire consequences. There will be dire consequences for you if you do not obey my orders. What are your thoughts on the Hasbro WWF figures of the late 80s, early 90s? Also, any thoughts on Bionic 6? Um, I have all the Bionic 6, and I will be reviewing that uh, at some point this year, so watch for that. Um, as far as Hasbro WWF, I was never that into wrestling. My next door neighbor had them. They were the big rubber WWF figures. Um, I wasn't all that into figures that couldn't move, that could just be bashed together. I know that there's huge love for the wrestling figures and the figure market, and I'm glad that, you know, there's a huge fan base for that because any action figure based toy, physical toy, I think helps the whole toy industry and the, the toy hobby. So, um, I would happily do 
a video about them, but I would need to borrow somebody's collection because I don't see myself wanting to really invest in those. Where do you see retro blasting on the 10th anniversary? And what would you do with retro blasting if you had an unlimited budget? Um, probably on the 10th anniversary of retro blasting, I will be wondering how I'm ever going to afford a holographic camera or whatever dumb technology they come out with for YouTube. Um, and if retro blasting had an unlimited budget, then I would be, I would be doing uh, larger documentaries that I could sell to streaming services. I would, I would be trying to pitch documentary ideas to streaming services. That's what we've always wanted to do. You know, a lot of people have been hitting us up, asking us about this, this thing coming out called the toys that made us or something like that. It, I guess it's coming out next year. It's a documentary mini series. And people have been saying, did they consult with you? Did they talk to you? Do you know if they watched your videos? And I'm like, I don't know the answer to any of those questions, but if I had an unlimited budget and I could do this as a career, that's what I would be doing. I feel like a lot of these things, if we could get, if we had the time and the money and the connections that you get when you have the money, you would be able to get really great interviews with some of the people who were the the people who worked at the toy companies or the people who worked at the cartoon distribution places and things like that so that you could really find out why they made the decisions they made. I think... In doing research for the Thundercats panel uh, last year at Dragon Con, I read Hear the Roar, which is sort of an unofficial fan-based sort of book about the making of Thundercats and interviews with all the different players. And that is so interesting. And, and getting that on film and sort of talking about it gives you such a different insight into what, what goes into making these cartoons. Because we hear all the time, you know, Oh, well, why are you so upset about it? Why are you talking about this? It's just a cartoon. It's just a toy. And it's like, well, a number of people, hundreds and hundreds of people had this as their careers in the 80s. So, and now, I mean, people, adult people made these toys and these cartoons. It's not like a six-year-old made the Masters of the Universe stuff. Like, adults wrote this. They came up with the ideas. So... And they, some of them made significant amounts of money doing it. So I don't, if that's the standard by which you gauge success is, you know, well, obviously there's a big market for this, this stuff and some amount of thought went into it. I mean, artists, designers, writers, all these people are spending time thinking about it and they're adults. Like, why can we not also analyze it as adults? Do you think that you and Melinda will always be into toys and action figures? Uh, I will. Uh, on some level, I will always keep my childhood figures. Toy-wise, what toy line entertained you the most as a child? Toy-wise. Um, yeah, that would be Star Wars. Star Wars was just awesome. I know that's a very common answer, but there's a reason it's a common answer. It's because Kenner's Star Wars was just a expertly done, uh, perfectly executed toy line that just understood what a toy needed to be for a child, and it didn't go overboard with it. Can you talk about how much you hate Funko Pop again? Joey, I hate Funko Pop. I really hate them. They're not toys. They're just marketing trash. What toys from today do you think will be collectibles in 30 years? And how do you collect old apps from 2017 into 2050? Um, good point. Uh, I still wonder if people are going to be buying LG chocolates on eBay for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. You know, maybe one day I'll be able to retire by selling my old Motorola Razor flip phone to some you know, kid who was like 10 years old when his mom bought one and he's always wanted one. Aside from toy collecting and restoring, what are yours and Melinda's favorite hobbies? Well, I'll let Melinda speak for herself. My hobby is, uh, I love history. Um, I love uh, reading about uh, the Allied forces in World War II, uh, especially the, uh, the fighter pilots. Um, I really enjoy uh, adventure gaming like uh, Tomb Raider. Uh, I don't get those very often because they don't come out very often. I'm currently slogging my way through the Uncharted video game series, and I'm not really wild about it right now because, uh, I don't know, it's kind of weird to name a series Uncharted and then have the story based on so many cliches. My favorite hobby, I mean, right now, I'm in the process, now that we finally have the studio done, I finally have room to build out my artist studio. And um, I don't know if many of you know this, but 
that's I've always been an artist since I was a kid. That's always what I thought I was going to be um, growing up was like, oh, I'm going to be an artist one day. Like, and so probably I will hopefully be painting and um, maybe not sculpting because it's a little messy, but um, possibly stained glass. Um, lots of I like to create things. I like to sort of you know, bring something into the world that wasn't there before. And that's one of the things I love about this channel is sort of making these videos is something that, you know, we're creating something new and putting a, a certain spin and, and voice to something that, that doesn't exist yet. So it's it's like a, a great creative outlet. Do you keep all of the vintage toys you acquire for reviews or do you sell them? Yeah, I keep most everything unless I get duplicates because I never know when I'm going to get a new idea. So let's say I get a new idea about something funny about uh, Filmation Ghostbusters. Well, if I've sold them since I've done the video, then I'd have to go rebuy them again. And so the Retro Blasting Archive for us is like a big toolbox where we were able to go back and pull the things out again and, and use them for another video. When can we expect the Batman Animated Series two-part video? Sometime this year. I have everything ready to go on that. I just have to pull the trigger and actually write it. My question is, when will you do a Starcom video? Uh, Starcom might not happen for a little while because it might happen next year. Uh, I'd like to go to Yojo Outlet and Museum Center where they have the full Starcom collection um, because I've talked to uh, Chris and Kyle Cooper and Adam Mann and they've said that they will um, happily let me come visit and film their Starcom collection. I have the pieces that I want, but they have the whole shebang and um, I'd like to bring that to you guys. When are you going to do a Folly style series for Masters of the Universe? Uh, this is from Dan. Uh, Dan, we kind of already do. Strider. Strider. And another thing. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoy a tour of the bottom of my foot because I'm going to kick you into another dimension, you blundering fool! Prison cells would be cool, or stairs, that would really rule. But sadly, I got this here. So you don't really need the power swords to get into Skull. You can get your sorcerer friend to just magic you inside. You can even tunnel underneath. What's to say Skeletor just can't fly his Rotan to the roof and get in that way? That Stratos thinks he's a bird out of my way, you big dumb turd with a he man's really boned. This Rotan came rolling home. I know we have, we've done Masters of the Universe uh, videos, but it might be interesting to sort of make other toy lines into a Follies thing. Like... Motu Follies, like Star Wars Follies, but Motu Follies. Michael's making a face at me. He doesn't like that idea, but... Ah, that sucks! I don't know. I think that's an interesting idea. That's good! That is the list of questions that we have for our five-year anniversary Q&A. Thank you guys so much for watching, and we will see you on the next video coming very soon.